London, good evening. Uh, I think I got caught uh, dancing along to our little intro there. Um, I, I so, how are things? Your makeup. No? <laughs> I'm a bit of a difficult proposition with all this on my face. How is life in the north, Brendan? The frozen north? Uh, well, of course, yeah, the frozen north indeed. It was quite hot today, as it has been. Tropical far. south, I'm in a t shirt. Yeah, well, so am I. I think we, we've got the, um, the colour coordination spot on tonight. Uh, yeah, all's good. Uh, this is, of course, the highlight of the week, Ollie, for me. It just shows you um, how dull my week has been. I've been looking forward to it. Since uh, 10 p.m. last Thursday, I was counting down the nights. But here we are. And uh, how's all down in that deep south? Um, pretty good. Pretty good. Um, you know, it's back to semester at the university. Obviously, we're still in virtual classes. Um, I know you're a big fan of children going back to school. And uh, we had a water cut off. Uh, today, because uh, a, a water hydrant up on the septima burst, and there's water all over the place on the septima. It's funny, Brendan, isn't it, how whenever there's anything wrong at my end of uh, the water supply, Aqueducto can't get onto me fast enough to complain and hector and worry and bully and uh, put up extra uh, charges. When they explode a hydrant and I'm without water for 20 hours, not a word. Funny that. They'll take their time, indeed. They will, indeed. It's the same with internet companies and the whole works. By the way, I'm glad you uh, added to that. I, I, I wasn't too sure where you were going when you said, uh, Brendan, you're a big fan of children going back to school. <laughs> Thank you very much for finishing. <laughs> anyway, what have we got coming up on uh, Bogger Tonight? Columbia's only live and interactive English language chat show. Well, it's all about those foot in mouth moments, or faux pas, if you will. Yes, what amounts to conduct unbecoming, culturally speaking, in Colombia. You think you've just closed the taxi or car door in a manner that uh, ensures it's properly shut, yet the driver behaves as if you've blown it off its hinges. How about uh, taking with your bare hands a piece of bread you intend to eat? Bread that's been exposed to flies, pigeons and the general pollutants of the open air. And you get a look that suggests you're some sort of grotesque animal. There are many Colombian no-nos to discuss, and we'll be doing just that in about 30 minutes. Of course, we want to hear about your faux pas experiences, whether you're a perplexed foreigner or a local who just can't understand why we extranjeros don't know how to properly behave. Uh, do get your messages into us using the live comments section, or if you're watching the recorded uh, version of this, you can still get involved by commenting on where you're watching or via tweet, the handle being at Bogota Post with the hashtag Bogota Night. First up, though, it's been a pretty busy news week uh, with our dear Presidente Duque coming in for some flack for his poor use of Spanish. Uh, you can always come and talk English to us here on Bogota Night, uh, Ivan, and we don't judge, not at all. Uh, but before that, Ali, we had a couple of high profile COVID deaths uh, with Defence Minister Carlos Holmes uh, Trujillo being, we reckon anyway, the highest serving politician to die with the infection anywhere in the world. Now, while there have been many glowing tributes paid to him, uh, his passing was also met with an amount of social media jeering in some quarters. Was that negativity a step too far? It's a difficult one, Brendan, because um, I absolutely appreciate the sentiment of saying, you know, this was a man who seems to be very indifferent to the lives of many. Uh, this was a man who didn't seem to particularly value the lives of, of those he considered, um, you know, his enemies. He was never a fan of peace. He was very much a fan of, um, uh, you, you know, finishing the war through, through bloody and brutal means. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I would like to think that the thing that separates people like him from people like us is that we don't revel in the death of others. Um, you know, I think this is a tremendously sad moment uh, for Colombia, like it is when any um, when any sort of uh, high public figure uh, dies. Whatever you might think about politicians in Colombia, uh, and they do come in rightly, I think, often, uh, they come in for a lot of flack for being um, 
greedy and corrupt in general. But let's not beat around the bush, Brendan. There are many ways to be greedy and corrupt in Colombia, and there's many better ways to make money than going into politics, frankly, frankly put. So, you know, let's give him the benefit of the doubt and say that he truly believed in what he uh, did. I disagree very much with the methods uh, to which he wanted to achieve those ends. Um, and, and I think it's unfortunate when any human being dies. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so your point is, Ali, in the sense that the fact that he did go into politics shows at least some sort of general good that he had for, for what he believed would be a, a better Colombia or working. Yeah, look, I, I know people will call me naive for this. But, um, I think most people that go into politics do have a genuine uh, want in some way uh, to serve the country. I mean, yeah, maybe they don't necessarily want the best thing for all of wider society, but they certainly want to help serve other people. If they didn't want to do that, they certainly wouldn't ascend to positions uh, like this. You know, if you want to sit around and get fat being corrupt, there are many easier ways to do it. Go and be the mayor of a, a, of a relatively large town. You know, go into business where you can operate completely in the shadows. You know, I'm not saying that politicians are never corrupt. I'm just saying there are worse people out there. There are some saving graces, at least, to politicians. Yeah, and, and yeah. I guess whatever your personal opinion about um, Carlos Holmes Trillo, I mean, is it is it necessary to go on social media, make memes and, and share them and write negative comments? I mean, the man is dead. He's gone. Um, yes, there may be a lot of things that he should have been held responsible for that he now won't. But what do, what, what purpose is being served by writing negative comments when, when somebody has passed away? Uh, yeah, that's the bit I don't get. I mean, there's, there's one thing, you know, celebrating with um, uh, your friends, maybe. Uh, you know, you might say it's distasteful, you might not. And, and I think, by the way, I, I need to be very clear about this. Um, I don't think it's appropriate either to gloss over the negatives um, of this man. I don't think it's necessary to kind of pretend uh, that this was, you know, an irredeemably good uh, human. I think we need to be really careful about that. I mean, I think one of the biggest problems with somebody like Holmes Trujillo dying is that there is no chance now of him ever being brought to justice. I mean, how, if you're saying that you consider him to be a political enemy, that you consider him to be somebody that you want to see facing justice, well, this is, you still haven't got what you want. Um, so, yeah, I think we do need to be a little careful about that. There's a, I do understand when people say this is a man who valued other people's lives very lowly. Why should I value his life? And I would say, well, because you can be a better person uh, than him frankly. And, and I think it's part of a wider, um, it's a kind of wi a wider problem I always feel uh, for the left wing in general, that they get very obsessed with folk demons, you know, whether it's Thatcher in England or whether it's uh, Uribe in Colombia, people get obsessed with it, with these single figures. Um, and they really do obsess over them in a way that the right wing seems to just be able to move on very quickly. If you look at, for example, Trump, you know, he had this quick moment of uh, attacking Hillary and then boom, on to the next target. You know, he keeps it moving. He doesn't fixate on these one, uh, on these single people. Yeah, actually, yeah. not that I want to go down the, the road of talking about US politics, but that's probably a very good point because the Democrats are still fixated on Donald Trump when he's now locked away in Mar-a-Lago or wherever he is in Florida. Like, why can't they move on? But it seems, you know, they're fixated on, on ensuring that, that Trump uh, and his family can never enter politics again. But yeah, it's 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 a good point. But I guess history it will be the judge on this, and this is where people can have their say going forward. That the history books will will write about this moment and this period in in uh, in Colombia, and he will be part of that. Of course, he was a founding father of Centro Democratico, arguably Colombia's first real populist, certainly of the right party, which of course Alvaro Uribe. Leeds and Ivan Duque, our president, our current president, is part of. 
Um, so a crucial man in Colombian politics and, and history will judge him um, however it will judge him, I guess. Well, time will tell. Now, he wasn't the only uh, death we had. There was also another one which I guess kind of fell under the radar because of the, the personality that was the defence minister. But the uh, head of the, uh, well, the English translation will be the president of the General Workers Confederation, uh, a guy named Julio Roberto Gomez. So two high profile deaths where I guess people are kind of going, it just shows you COVID can kill anybody. But we were talking about this earlier, probably not 100% correct to say that. Oh, yeah, let's not let, let's all watch out for that, because, you you know, I've already seen it, you know, people saying, oh, well, it affects us all this terrible disease, it affects us all equally. It absolutely does not. I mean, I, I think that's a fallacy uh, of the highest order. Yeah, exactly. Actually, um, I was listening to uh, a well-known, controversial, uh, if I must say, Dr. J. Batichara in the U.S. And as you said, California is a great example of this, that uh, whatever one's believes in lockdowns or whatever, but they seem to have served the richer folk uh, much better than the poorer folk, Latinos, blacks uh, in California still suffering. Uh, we'll, we'll have an article about that tomorrow. Uh, or I will have an article about that tomorrow morning, uh, Brendan, and I know you've written about it as well. Yeah, so looking forward to that. We will check that out. Yeah, and anyone can check out Wrong Way Corrig in the blog and get my thoughts on that. Let's move on, though, Ali, uh, sticking with COVID, um, but away from the deaths, and uh, an easing easing up, I should say, of uh, of restrictions. Are we moving into now what will be the new normal for the next six months? <laughs> I mean, that's, I well, well, what do you want me to say? I, I, I don't have the ear of the mayor. Um, I and and all, all, to jump out from behind you know, all jokes aside, Brendan, at the moment, this is just such a crapshoot. You know, we had all assumed that there was going, you know, we were absolutely nailed on for another weekend lockdown, but there isn't one. We got told it was the end of um, quarantine by locality, which, to be fair, by strict definition, is true. But now we've got nine special upezes. Remember them? The upezes, the special zones, they're back. Um, so, um, what are they? Yeah, God they're knows. In the whole areas, they're little neighbourhoods within <laughs> districts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's quite correct, yeah. I mean, it's essentially a barrio, Okay. more or less. Um, some of them have quite odd um, definitions, but they're roughly based on barrios. Um, so we've got another nine of those, mainly in the south, but there's um, two in Usuken and I think two in Suba, the, the, the latter of which has, um, has had demonstrations already against it. Um, yeah, and, and, then, and then what else have we got? So the, the nightly curfew. So tonight, of course, we've all been good boys and girls, haven't we, for the last uh, hour and a quarter. Um, but tomorrow, we'll still have a quarter of an hour. Sorry, we'll still be running um, until 10 o'clock. So we've got a bit more uh, freedom. And there won't be the mass shutdowns that we've seen before. However, in a move that... I don't really know how to describe this other than absolutely insane. Um, there won't be any cyclobia and uh, all parks, well, all major parks are going to be closed. Those that can be closed. Thankfully, my local park, the Parque Nacional, uh, doesn't have a fence or a wall around it, so they, they can't close it off. And the police have no interest in closing it off anyway. You know, all the evidence, Brendan, seems to say People spread COVID by being inside. So saying, all right, you can go to a bar, you can go to a restaurant, you can go to a cafe, you can all hang around inside. You can't go to the park, though. You can't go to that big open air zone where, you know, your breath just dissipates into a massive body of air. No, no, that's not possible. Keep yourself inside. Keep yourself locked in. And, you know, and it, again, it comes back to this point that you were making earlier, Brendan, that, you know, uh, if you've got a nice big house that's comfortable to sit around in, bully for you. But if you're somebody, as many people in Colombia are, who's living in a, a sort of more cramped 
uh, space where you can't spread out, where it's maybe not so comfortable. You know, going to the park is, especially on a Sunday, again, many people here work six days a week. Um, you're going to the uh, park on a Sunday is a really important kind of pressure valve to, to, to get out, to, to get a bit of sunshine, especially in this weather, and, and just not to be on top of each other uh, kind of family-wise. Yeah, no, yeah. obviously I 100% agree to that. But at times, Ali, I feel like I'm living in a, a parallel universe up here because um, wow. the last week, because as we always say, an important thing to say as well and, and restate that the devil is in the policing of this or the non-policing uh, seems to be happening. And for the last week, I thought the eight o'clock curfew was kicked to touch because I had been walking home a few nights this last week at like 8.39 and, and a number of shops were still operating as normal. Um, so don't know what happened there. Also, there's a park on just off the, the roundabout or the round point, as they would say here on 183, just before 16. It's a park that can't really be closed, but there's an exercise section in it, which would be easy for the police to kind of go, hey, guys, you know, this is extracting the urine to be using this. But it's busy every morning. I walk by there at 9, 9.30. There are about 10 to 15 people there exercising away. Fair play to them, by the way, for doing that. But you know, but by, by the strict definition of of the regulations that are in place, that shouldn't uh, be happening. So yeah, uh, no. it's yeah, it's kind of uh, the point is, Ali. Obviously, you are the expert in terms of what the new regulations and restrictions are, or whatever. But um, I've kind of given up listening to them at this stage. I kind of go about my business, knowing that I've been doing it for the last few months and nobody said anything to me. So I just go go about uh, our business now. Before we go on to the next topic. Um, my fellow Irishman and neighbour has been writing frantically. Has, has he said anything good to say there, uh, Ali? Have you read that comment that Kieran's just sent in? Um, he says a lot of it comes back to perception. People see lots of people in the park on September, lose their minds, complaints, disgrace, and it's easy for them to shut those people up by closing parks. And parks obviously don't have owners who complain about lost profits. I mean, Kieran has a, a, a very reasonable point there. And actually, um, parks do have businesses. Um, Kieran might be surprised to know, you know, there are people there that sell food, that sell trinkets and all that kind of thing. And actually, they're not losing business um, in the Parque Nacional because, you know, as I said before, it's it's not closed. I suppose they're losing a bit of business in terms of it not quite being as busy. But I've got to say, on going out for my second dog, well, third dog walk today, um, pushing the boundaries, <laughs> pushing the boundaries, um, there was just nothing, you know, there was, the, there was exactly as many people as I would expect there to be on a, on a January afternoon midweek. Yeah, and as I said, up here, it's obviously, I'm not going to say it's normal, but like for the new normal, you're kind of going, this is okay. It's, I, I can live with this, as I have been for the last few months. There are cars going down uh, Trace right now. There are cars going up September that I can hear from... Um, you know, from outside my window. Yeah. Well, anyway, no doubt we're going to be talking about this for the next few weeks as well. It's going to roll on. And, of course, speaking of roll on, uh, rollouts of vaccines, uh, hopefully coming next month. Um, but we, we'll talk about all of that in, in episodes to come. Uh, something close to a lot of uh, foreigners' hearts, though, Ollie, uh, visas and all that kind of stuff. And it, it kind of seems to be now that La Cancelleria are granting visas by popular vote. Uh, they they do, they can't seem to make a decision themselves, so they put it out to, to the public. Next, we're going to be having a referendum on every <laughs> visa that goes before La Cancelleria. Tell us the background to the latest craziness in, in craziness at the Cancelleria, I guess. Okay, so there's a lady called uh, Sabine, who's a Dutch national, uh, been in Colombia for quite a while, and she set up a foundation. Uh, to help impoverished uh, children in, in poor barrios in Medellin. So did did good she person. actually set it up? Just, just to clarify. No, she was involved in, the, involved in the foundation, I think, um, in, in, of these in, in, involved in setting up these foundations. It's a very annoying uh, verb-noun combination there, foundation of a foundation. Anyway, uh, seems like a good person. Seems like somebody you want in your country, right, Brendan? You've got somebody's come in, 
they've addressed the societal problem and they want to do something about it. Better yet, they don't need to be paid. Even better, they bring in money from outside, specifically mainly from the Netherlands. And she's bringing all this money in. You know, people in the Netherlands who, thanks to her, know about these problems in Colombia and want somehow to help. And there's football classes and, and English classes and, you know, uh, helping people sort of get on the right track to go into Senna classes. And, and which, by the way, I think Senna is fantastic. I, I wish it was better supported by the government. Um, you know, all of that Sabine is doing. And, and you think to yourself, wow, what a wonderful person. And she gets her visa denied. Now, the reason she got her visa denied isn't really clear. Uh, there's a rather unhelpful journalist in some ways um, championing her cause and he's saying, oh, you know, I, I know it's <laughs> not usually. Um, and he's he's kind of saying here, look, you know, um, this is a completely arbitrary measure. It's been taken without um, without due consideration, etc., etc. Let us not forget that the Cancelleria of Colombia, the Foreign Ministry, essentially, you know, like all other visa issuers in the world, it retains the right, it reserves the right um, to have flexibility on on who they approve and who they don't. We don't know the ins and outs of Sabine's case. I'm certainly not saying that I think there's anything dodgy um, about her visa application. I just simply don't know. I, I don't know what the situation is. And there could be a number of different reasons why the Cancelleria didn't want to um, didn't want to approve it. However, um, and, and Sabine seems like an absolutely wonderful person, I have to say. She you know, seems absolutely exemplary. I mean, I, I can't see this. The problem is the uh, for the Cancelleria, let's say, I mean, it's a good thing for Colombia. The Cancelleria have set up a precedent here. You know, we've seen Dominic Wolf, we've seen Zach Morris, we've seen how uh, a YouTube channel and something, you know, relatively insignificant and taking money off of, uh, you know, basically marketing Colombia to Colombians. That gets you a visa. Residency, even nationality, why not? Yeah, so. There's a very reasonable question to ask here. Well, what if Sabine or somebody like her goes on also on social media and says, well, I've been treated unfairly. Here's all the good that I do. And she's got a much better case than Zach Morris or Dominic Wolf. So, you know, you can see where from that the country are in a difficult position. Because if they say, oh, no, no, we're not, we're not bending the rules for this wonderful uh, woman who does all this charity work, but we are bending it for somebody who's fled Colombia really fast. It's not a good look, is it? So they've been this. But where does it all end, Brendan? It, you know, I, is your visa going to ultimately deci be decided on how good your backstory is? Is this what it's going to be? Are we going to set up kind of, um, you know, are we going to have judges' houses? Are we going to have a whole... Uh, kind of pop idol style. Where does it end? Yeah, well, that's exactly. I, I kind of lost you a little bit there in the connection, but exactly. Yeah, it's like kind of X Factor pop idol. Um, Colombia's Got Talent. Uh, how can you prove to the judges that your case is worthy enough to get the visa? Now, of course, surely it would be other countries have talent. Well, yeah, yeah, surely yeah. that would be the name of it. <laughs> Well, 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 yeah. Have you got enough talent to, to stay here in Colombia? That's the thing. But of course, now with Serene, just just to be clear on that, the latest is is that La Rio said she can because she's in Amsterdam at the moment, I believe, or in Holland in, in the Netherlands, that she can come back here now and sort out her visa situation. Because the difference as well with her her case, like as opposed to when I had my difficulties last uh, the back end of last year, um my original M application was deemed inadmissible, which there's a difference between deemed inadmissible to being denied. Uh, her, because when you're denied, officially you can't reapply for, you have to wait six months. So she was denied. So technically she should have, um, she should be waiting six months, but now she can come back in and apply. But it is rather, uh, yeah, it's just like, as you said, where does it end? Cancer have set a precedent here that anybody now who has some sort of a difficulty and feel they feel hard done by, well, yeah, let's uh, go on social media and uh, uh, and see where we where we can go with it.
But wait, Brendan, you must have a good story. You can't just go on social media. You've got to have something good. Well, wear a Colombian jersey at least when you do it. <laughs> just a reminder, guys, by the way, in, uh, very shortly we're going to be um, uh, talking about Boaz, I believe is uh, how you say the plural of that, that French word, uh, or foot and mouth moments here. If you're um, not really up to the, the cult cultural element here in Colombia, making mistakes. Brent, Brent, Brendan, I, th I, th I think from our islands, it's very much a faux pas to use the phrase foot in mouth. If you if you remember the the chaos uh, yes. of the early two thousands, yeah, that was our well, a, a kind of a precursor, although for animals, but to, to what we're suffering now with COVID. Uh, but yeah, so guys, uh, tell us about your kind of um, faux pas that you've experienced uh, here in Colombia. Are Colombians are, are there things that when you look at foreigners, you're kind of going, what are they doing? Is that guy wearing? Um, sandals walking around the Candelaria. What's he doing? Showing off his bare feet. Uh, we're going to be talking about that in about five minutes' time or so. But um, we mentioned, or you mentioned in passing, Zach Morris, of course, who was given citizenship by uh, Presidente Duque back in 2018. I think one of the one of the first things on Duque's list as president was to give citizenship to Zach. Morris, who's now no longer in the country, I believe. And he had a little bit of a go via Twitter and his social media at President Duque, who uh, messed up his Spanish yesterday or whenever it was this week. What exactly did was the mistake he made that's got him an awful lot of flack? Kerry, instead of Kerria, I guess. Um, a sackable offence? <laughs> no. I mean, again, this comes back to the thing that there's this big thing, isn't it? People just love to nitpick and whine. And I realise the hypocrisy of this. People love to nitpick and whine. You know, there are many things to complain about when it, when it comes to Ivan Duque. You know, he, you know, when we see him on his little television show and whatnot, he just looks so staggeringly arrogant. Uh, when our editor interviewed him, he was, of course, um, the head of the No campaign uh, in the plebiscito, the successful No campaign. A lot of people wrongly claim that he was a political nobody before he ran for president. That's actually not really true, just most people are quite ignorant. Um, anyway, yeah, our editor spoke to him and, you know, he was just evasive, difficult, smarmy, smooth, you know, everything you don't like about a politician. He's current. Was that a one-on-one -on -one interview that uh, Emma had with him? Yeah? Yes, so, yeah, I think it was, okay. yeah. Um, and, I mean, no, obviously it wasn't anywhere near as high profile then as he is now. But, I mean, yeah, we're talking about an intensely dislikable man. Picking him up for a slight slip of the tongue, my gosh. This is like criticising Duque for Coffefi. You know, it's a mistype on Twitter. That's it. And, and again, there's something deeply disquieting about picking on a politician saying, oh, well, you know, he's, he's no compassion. He's a really difficult person. He doesn't care about other people. Oh, by the way, we're also going to mock him for a small mistake. You know, you're playing his game and he's probably going to be better at it uh, than you are. Um, so I think that's just deeply... Uh, unhelpful. I think this is a real non-event. Think of how many times this must have happened in the past and never been picked up on. And I think it's symptomatic of a wider problem, which is that Duque cannot do right for doing wrong. Because it doesn't matter what he does. And, and I think the vaccines are a really good example of this. There is a, cert there is a large section, or certainly a large section of my uh, rarefied media world, um, that will criticize Ivan Duque reflexively. It doesn't matter what he does, it doesn't matter what he says, it doesn't matter what's behind it. And this is dangerous because at the moment, we are letting off the hook these rich world countries who are hoarding vaccines. And this is immoral, Brendan. This is absolutely disgraceful. This is a moral issue. We are talking about the health of millions, tens of millions of people potentially. And for countries like my country, Great Britain, like your country as part of the EU, you know, where they are threatening not to send vaccines across borders, where they are threatening not to release them, 
where certain distributors of certain vaccines are starting to say things like, well, yeah, you know, you can jump the queue, Colombia, if you pay more. So what's Ivan Duque meant to do? Is he meant to give in to hectoring and bullying from countries that, frankly, should be subsidizing Colombia, not charging them extra? I, I think it's woefully unfair. And, and yet the criticism from many people who I think should be criticizing these countries, they're instead taking the easier route of laying into Duque and saying, oh, well, he can't get it done. Well, I'll give you a clue. Most of the EU can't get it done either. The list of countries that can get it done is pretty much the US, the UK and Israel. Right now, yeah, that's, yeah. that's who's been efficient and quicker at uh, vaccinating. How? They've thrown money at it and they happen to have been the countries which invented uh, you know, those vaccines. They've got massive advantages. They're also so much better organized uh, you know, than a country like Colombia. And I think it's grossly unfair. Frankly, if Colombia gets any vaccines out in uh, February, I consider that to be a job extremely well done. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I read something. Uh, now, I may not get this 100 percent correct, but of the millions of vaccines that have already been administered in, in the UK, Israel and the US, something like 25 in whether it's emerging market or, or, or third world countries. That, that's that's low income countries. And that was from a couple of weeks ago. It's probably gone up. But, but yes, I mean, it, it, we're talking about, you know, literally three or four orders of magnitude difference, you know, and, and that's just, I mean, this is an absolute disgrace. And the World Health Organization are criticizing this. Um, you know, there are voices standing up, but what I'm not seeing is voices uh, within Colombia. I'm seeing people defend Duque, I'm seeing people attack Duque, and I'm not seeing people say, you know, actually this isn't to do with Colombia. It doesn't matter who Colombia has as president. You know, we could have a stuffed puppet up there, probably would do as good a job and be less arrogant uh, and, and more self-effacing with it. But nonetheless, it wouldn't change the fact. If those vaccines are not available, they are not available. Unless you're saying, oh, no, we can pay whatever price, or, and I want to pay extra tax to, to, to basically uh, sling lots of money at horrible, huge uh, pharmaceutical companies who are using a privileged position uh, to price gouge. I don't, I don't think that's fair. Yeah, hundred hundred percent percent. I I guess uh, what politicians in in the likes of the UK and across Europe and the US would say it's it's like when you're flying a plane and and you get the safety advice and they say well before uh, you help a child or somebody else who needs help putting on their mask put on your own mask first. All right, I'll, I'll go along with that. But but listen, Brendan. I mean, when you look at places like the UK putting in orders now for something like four times our population, what on earth can be the justification for that? Uh, medically, I guess there might be an argument or a case made well, well that, uh, number one, you need two jabs. So six months down the line. No, no, this is four, four times capacity. But, but, but yeah, exactly. I mean, it's basically it's covering your bases. It's ordering Johnson and Johnson and uh, Oxford, AstraZeneca and Pfizer. So we just throw everything at the situation. Well, good, bully for you. But that means somebody else is missing out. Well, in fairness, uh, I heard that being addressed by the UK's former medical officer, would have been their chief medical officer. Um, can't remember his name now, but he was being interviewed today on, on Spectator TV. And as he said, the thing will be once the UK gets to a stage where they realize, OK, we're good, is not to draw down on those contracts. Because he said it's easy to cancel them and then send them somewhere else. But if they get to the UK and then we realize, oh, we don't need these, it's much more difficult than to redistribute them out to other countries. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's where political leaders and, and those in charge need to need to be on the ball to make sure they do get there because obviously this is a global problem unless you want to lock yourself away forever and then keep uh, international travel to a minimum which i guess new zealand and australia are going to have to do for the next couple of years but uh, they are governed by sauron so you know that's their problem well 
Anyway, Ollie, uh, we've gone over the well over the half hour mark, and we've we've enough to get on with. We we, we lighten the, the the mood here a little bit. We shall try anyway, with our faux pas or our foot in mouth moments in Colombia. And there's a couple of things that maybe we just don't get, but there's a few big obvious ones, Ollie, to start off with. Um, well, they're obvious to us now. We've been here long enough, but maybe somebody just fresh off the plane uh, mightn't be aware that it's not too <laughs> PC to mention certain things. So get, get, run through those big, big, big ones, as you would say. Well, I mean, the big one's the uh, the C bomb, isn't it? Um, so coffee, y- coffee. Yeah. Colombia's famous uh, export powder, ground coffee. Yeah. yeah um, uh, look, I. Um, yeah, I mean, um, you know, I, I think I, I think Colombians are very sensitive about this. Um, I'm going to risk saying oversensitive, maybe. Uh, equally, I can fully, I, you know, I can sympathise. It's annoying enough for me, you know, having people say, "Oh, you, you're from England. Do you like the Queen? Have you met the Queen?" And I think, "Oh, yeah, okay," but they're not calling me a criminal. You know, whereas if I were a Colombian living uh, in the United States, for example, or Germany or Ireland or England, that might be a very different case. Uh, and I might not find it quite so funny. Also, it's worth pointing out, you know, none of my close family members have ever died because of the royals. Um, whereas, you know, that's that's you don't have to travel very far to meet a Colombian who's um uh, who's who's had a family member die or a friend die or whatever as a direct so, or sorry, indirect I, I, result I, I, of cooking. My Irish, this is just jumping out here. I have to say that maybe some of my family members died because of the royal family, but <laughs> I had to say that. <laughs> but we're not talking about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the cocaine issue, of course. It's yes. you know, there are certain parts of town here and parts of Colombia where, yeah, you probably could liberally uh, mention it and, and not get into any bother at all. Um, but it's best to play it safe. Example, yeah, I think I think it's overplayed sometimes, you know, this kind of thing, oh, you can't possibly mention cocaine. I mean, yeah, just don't go running your mouth. I mean, again, I wouldn't think this was actually something that would need addressing, frankly. You know, I, I would have thought most people in polite company would have not been an idiot. But um, I'm continually amazed, you know, I, I back in the days when we used to actually, um, you know, be allowed out, I used to fairly regularly drink in the centre of uh, Bogota, uh, because that's where I worked. And yeah, it wouldn't be unusual to hear, you know, a group of backpackers two two tables over in somewhere like Doña Ceci go, oh, cocaine, 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 I love cocaine. And you think, what the fuck is wrong with you guys? Keep a lid on it, yeah? Well, yeah, just a mouth would be enough for me. Of course, link to that, Ali. Um, now, when I first came to Colombia as a backpacker in 2009, if somebody walked up to me, and, and maybe this says more about me than, than, than uh, the man himself, but um, if somebody had said to me, Pablo Escobar, I'd be there, who, what, what are you on about? I, I actually didn't know anything about him. That is not the case today, thanks to a, a few high-profile programs, particularly one, Narcos on Netflix. So a lot of people who come here now, it's it's also the Pablo Escobar um, uh, issue. Sorry, I'm, ju- I'm just reading a comment here that's between us anyway. Um, <laughs> our producer is writing to us. Oh, uh, an in-joke, I won't explain that. But yeah, Pablo Escobar, you have a view on this. I, I have to put my hand up and say, uh, when I worked in a hostel in Medellin, I was invited for free. I didn't, I didn't pay to go on the Pablo Escobar tour and I did meet, allegedly, Roberto Escobar, Pablo's um, now kind of half-blind brother, because he was uh, attacked with a, a letter bomb attack, wasn't it? Um, and, and I have to say it was interesting because when I was first here in 2009, didn't know about Escobar, then somebody handed me on the way out of the country, leaving a hostel, I was handed Killing uh, Pablo, the book, and I read that, and I, I was fascinated by it. As somebody who was a big fan of The Sopranos, this was like, wow, this is like real life Sopranos kind of stuff. I just thought it was, uh, it was intriguing, the whole story. So then when I came back well, and I had to do that, it was, but I have to say, like from, from an educational point of view, 
I think it can be a good thing rather than okay that the more kind of superficial thing about oh here I am look at Pablo Escobar's house and imitating doing lines of cocaine or something stupid like that I, I think that's what it comes down to Brendan isn't it it's a case of how you do it I mean um, in the same way you know this is where Ricky Gervais always falls down where it's not quite clear whether he's sending up something or whether people are actually uh, following what he's saying that he thinks is satirical but people are actually following it um, and yes look when you've got countries with uh, more recent uh, problematic histories it's a difficult um, you know it's, it's a difficult um, subject to cover you know nobody's going to go to Auschwitz well actually I, I'm, sadly I, I'm sure they do now I come to think of it but let, let's hope that few people go to Auschwitz um, uh, and lark around or or treat it like some kind of um, you know some sort of, sort of positive thing um, whereas I think a lot of the Escobar themed or, 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 or slanted tourism, I think a lot of that is in a very glorifying way. And again, you know, we're not talking about ancient history here. We're not talking, you know, we're talking about very much living history. You know, these, there are people, and sadly, many fewer of them living um, than would have been had they're not being drug lords uh, bringing Medellin into absolute chaos in the 80s and 90s. Um, so, you know, this is very much, and it is worth remembering, I, I think you alluded to this uh, in our pre-planning, that, you know, uh, there are Colombians, especially in Medellin, who still, I think revere is a strong word, but who who's sort of appreciate and think Pablo Escobar was a, um, a hero of the people. That, that's not a completely unknown view. In fact, the only person I've ever seen wearing a um, a Pablo Escobar t-shirt in Colombia wasn't a tourist, um, but in fact a, a paisa who um, I, we kind of were a couple of people down the line from uh, going across the uh, Chicamoca uh, Canyon. Yeah, and uh, I think I told you, yeah, I remember one of my regular colectivos that that I would take uh, from the center going to class up the north here in Bogota, they had a, a photo of Pablo Escobar. Because, I mean, there's another side of this, and I, I remember I recorded a podcast when I was doing the podcast with Samana to a group um, in Medellin, and it was kind of about erasing Pablo, or I forget the exact name of the campaign. It was around the time when they demolished uh, one of his oh, yeah. buildings. which I, Yeah. I mean, I think that, again, is... Like it's part of the, it's part of the history, uh, the makeup here. That like to erase it kind of means like it almost kind of sounds or like it didn't happen. Forget about it. Uh, I mean, I don't think that's the way forward. I it, it's educational and learn from it so that these mistakes can't happen again. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know anybody who's been to a place like Auschwitz or like Twelsleng in uh, Cambodia. Or any of these, you know, the killing fields, of course, in Cambodia, you know, these tremendously grim places. You know, I've been to the um, uh, the H bomb center in uh, Hiroshima. I've been to the A bomb center in Nagasaki, and these are all really, really powerful um, places. And, and you know, closer perhaps to where we are now, um, you can go to countries uh, like Salvador, for example, or Nicaragua or um, uh, Chile is absolutely superb. Um, Chile is absolutely superb um, memorial to, uh, to to their dictatorship. And, you know, these are, are very moving places, and I, I absolutely, I, I think you shouldn't. But, but again, none of these, there is absolutely nothing there. There are no T-shirts in on sale in Santiago that glorify Pinochet. Who? Isn't a particular, you know, isn't a massively unpopular figure with many Chilenos, uh, e even to this day, but it hasn't filtered through into the tourists. And I think that's the key thing. There's a really big difference between, um, you know, a, 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 an ill informed foreigner coming in telling Colombian saying, and a Colombian saying, well, this is how I viewed the reality of my country in those days. Those are two really different uh, experiences.
Okay, yeah, uh, well, I said we'd kind of lighten the, the mood a little bit, but we've got a bit heavier again. A little bit dark. Yeah, but yeah. So, what about this then, Brendan? This is my a personal bugbear that, you know, I know many Colombians get, uh, uh, get irritated by this, and it irritates me also. Flip flops. Why are you wearing flip flops in Bogota? Where is the beach? One of the proudest moments I have ever had, you know, my students are all very much aware of my disdain for tourists in flip flops in the Candelaria. And, and also, I would say the Candelaria is one of the very last places on earth I would want to be walking around with exposed feet, frankly. It's not like those, you know, there's a lot you could stand in that, frankly, you wouldn't want your skin touching. Anyway, I was once at the yeah. oh, no, I was at the Butero oh. Museum with a bunch of students, and one of my students went up to a, a young tourist and sort of who looked absolutely was like, "Wow, this girl's just come and spoke to me. I must be the bee's knees." Uh, and up saunters my students, say, "Oh, hello, are you? Are you from another country? You're not Colombian, are you?" And he says, "Oh, no." I'm, I'm from, I'm sad to say, he's, he said he's from Britain. You know, really looking like the cat got the cream and she said, oh, I, I thought that because you must not know that there are no beaches in Bogota because you are wearing uh, shoes for the beach. At which point I had to go over and say, um, don't, don't, don't bother people randomly. That's great, that's great. But don't, don't bother him, just come on, move along. I've never been so proud of a student as I was on that day. Well, like, would you give a pass to to a foreigner who comes here who's been backpacking around South America in a lot of um, warm cities or whatever, and there's just kind of the 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 style is to wear your flip flops that kind of becomes the the norm. Uh, so then you get to Bogota and you're kind of thinking, well, it's Colombia, it's a hot. Is it though? Is it? Is it? Whoa, 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 Yeah, look, okay, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, it's sort of normal to. But actually, I'd say if you're in Lima, which is a pretty warm place, I think we can both agree, usually, um, you don't really see people strolling. I, I tend to find Latinos in general are fairly well dressed most of the time. I'm always no, amazed. I'm not, I'm not about the tourists that come here. Like they come no, 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 absolutely. I'm getting that. But what I'm saying is those tourists have been through, let's say, La Paz in Bolivia. Yeah, good luck wearing flip-flops in La Paz. I'm, um, pretty sure did. I'm pretty sure when I was there, um, not that my memory of La Paz is hazy. On, on the three separate occasions I was there, it's hazy on all of them. But um, I'm pretty sure they did. Traveling across the Bolivian Altiplano and you're wearing your flip flops. Come on. And, and also, I mean, I, again, this thing, just read what's around you. Okay. I, I'll, I'll give you a thing. I can imagine, I can imagine a kind of, um, I can imagine sort of, you know, a bit of discombobulation on the first day, but pretty quickly, wouldn't you look around you and go, everyone keeps looking at me funny and there isn't the beach. And nobody else is wearing flip flops. Yeah, I, I, I the thing is, Ali. Uh, now I might get into trouble for this, but I'm pretty sure that Andy Farrington, the owner of the Cranky Crock, still wears his shorts and flip flops. He's an Australian um, when he's around there. Um, you know, so for some cultures, perhaps it's just it's just what they do. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, okay, I mean, there's an element, I think, at which you need to do a little bit of cultural adjustment. But I think also, I just, I don't think, I, I can't imagine doing it in England either, even at the height of summer. I can imagine wearing flip-flops in England at the height of summer, sure. I can imagine, you know, going out to the park or whatever in flip-flops, maybe. Maybe even a, a, a pub garden. I certainly wouldn't be going inside a pub. Wearing flip flops? The bloody yeah, well, hell is wrong with you? Dance, to be honest, <laughs> we don't get the weather. Full stop. I you know, it's, it's one day. thing. But but again, this is what we were talking about earlier, wasn't it? You know, Colombians tend to be quite formal. I think. You know, I'm always amazed that when I'm on the, you know, in some part of Colombia where it's blazingly hot, and you know, that's many different places, um, and yet people, you know, religious Justly on around often, uh, you know, wearing long trousers, long shirts, sometimes even jackets. Incredible. 
Yeah, yeah, well, that's the formal side of it. And, and as you, like, there's this kind of dapperness, if I can use that word, with the Colombians in, in many aspects. I mean, they're obsessed with uh, very good teeth, the majority anyway, seem to be. Uh, having a decent pair of shoes. Like, like to be honest, I haven't bothered last year really to uh, to update my, my wardrobe because I'm not... I'm not in meetings. It's, you know, this is the, the 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 height of it. Doing these Zoom calls, I could be here not wearing any trousers, and you can you can think about that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, like so, I'm wearing these pair of runners that I'm literally running into the ground, and in the barrio where you know you don't have too many uh, people with uh, a good amount of d uh, disposable income. But well, they're kind of going, oh, Brendan, you had your your runners or your tennis or a bit of disrepair at this but I'm, 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 they're fine they, they do the job i don't need to buy a new pair right now but yeah they're kind of all those little what i would call minor details I, it, obviously if you're going to a an important meeting and things like that but just running around your normal neighborhood and you're not doing anything exceptional like why the need to look smart um the way i put it but here they are kind of yeah, and I think I think there is a perception that foreigners are quite scruffy as well, um, and and I think that's fair actually. Looking around, I mean, the amount of people I've seen trying to go into a nightclub without a collar, and, and not without a collar in a kind of you know, well, okay, but it's a nice T-shirt. Just literally, no, that's just an average regular T-shirt I was wearing all day, and I haven't bothered to put on a clean one. I was thinking, really, I. Like, Seems odd to me. Um, something I quite like about it. I mean, in fact, I would love uh, Bogotanos to go even more back to their roots. I'd like to see young men wearing hats again. I don't see that anymore, do you? No. You certainly Show my that. age now. Yeah, the, the, odd, the odd few, perhaps. Um, but then there's the inconsistencies, because I kind of mentioned, mentioned this in the, uh, in the intro. Like, hygiene inconsistencies, I'll put it. You go into a panadry and you, you grab bra bread with your hands, perhaps that you're, you're that you're going to take to to eat there and then, or, or it's your own bread anyway. And they were looking, oh, you can't touch that, but yet it's bread that's been left out in the open. There's been flies flying around, uh, pigeons, as we mentioned, that <laughs> enter the panadry, and no one seems to bat an eyelid that there's a pigeon effectively yeah, yeah, yeah. with wings, yeah, uh, walking around the place, um, and then like they're obsessed with cleaning floors. 20 times over. Oh, God, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, but I kind of, at times there are these inconsistencies. Certain things are like, oh, no, you can't do that, and it has to be cleaned. But then they'll clean things. You mentioned this as well. Uh, okay, I know it comes down to price with some people. They don't want to boil water, but they clean with cold water. Um, oh, yeah, no, absolute nonsense, yeah. No, I mean you, you can't you can't kill germs with, um, with with cold water. What you're doing there is you're tidying up a plate. You're not um, you, you're not cleaning it. But but again as well, this is this leads us on. You know when we're talking about cleaning up, this leads us on to I think one of the biggest things. So this is quite hard for me. You know, there's uh, I'm from the south of England, but uh, my mother's family are very much from Yorkshire. And, you know, it's a very Yorkshire trait, as I'm sure you're aware, Brendan, you family living nearby uh, over there in Sheffield. Um, you know, it's a very Yorkshire trait to speak directly to the point and not to mess around, not to fanny up your words. So that comes as a bit of a shock, I think, to many Colombians when, for example, if somebody says to me something like, oh, what did you think of my band playing? And I go, yeah, wasn't impressed. And and I find this even even if it's not even if it's not a friend's band, even if it's just some random band, you know, I get a night, I don't know, there's four local bands playing, and I think I couldn't give a crap about two of them. And I listen to them and think, yeah, it's derivative, it's boring, there's nothing special, quite like the other two. But even talking to my friends who aren't in those bands necessarily, they'll go, Oh, how can you be so disrespectful? I'm like but I didn't think they were any good. Why? And, and there's this thing that, you know, criticizing everyone is seen as an ultimate no-no. You just can't do it. Do you yeah, find that? Yeah. I was going to say, I think Ireland kind of maybe falls between two schools on that, that we, we mightn't be as direct when it comes to giving criticism or our, our exact thoughts on something. But then 
the idea, like when it comes to greetings, we're talking about language, like getting to the point. Of, yeah, like there's nothing more infuriating for me, especially from messages, but it even happens just in general conversation of like the hola, and you're, yeah, hi, like, you know, kind of what do you want? And then, yeah, come on, you know, blah, 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 blah. like 10 messages are, if it's in a conversation, a waste of <laughs> five minutes to find out what exactly do you want. Um, like just tell me instead of wasting all this time. But yeah, so it's all that kind of little bit of small talk. But if you don't engage in it, they will think that you're quite rude. So that is certainly... Yeah, yeah and, and actually, yeah, I mean, I've had complete communication breakdowns on things like that before. So, you know, somebody's actually just stopped the conversation because I've said something like, okay, is there something you want to ask me? Yeah, yes, exactly. They're going to go, oh, oh, well, I was just... Uh, I was just saying hello initially. Of course, there is something they want to ask you, but you have to go through the whole pretense first to get to that. But just, just cut it out. There's no need for it. Yeah. What is the point? Yeah, I don't, I don't get it. And also, be honest. I don't. I find it really bizarre. My students are obsessed, Brendan, with with two points of view. It doesn't matter. It's almost. I mean, I have to go to the extremes. I have to say to them things like, "Does gravity exist?" Are there two points of view on the existence of gravity? Yeah? And, and they'll go, oh, well, no. And I'm like, then, then, look, there's nothing wrong with saying, I believe this, punta. You know, I know that other people think differently, but I don't think they're right. It doesn't mean I have to hate them. It doesn't mean I need to uh, put them to the sword. But equally, you don't have to take that seriously. But in Colombia, oh, very much so, yeah. Which is, by the way, getting worried. I see Angela's uh, written in and said, uh, ¿Cómo estás todo bien? If we engage Angela in this conversation, we'll be here for about another 20 minutes and we've only got two and a half minutes left of the show. So uh, thanks for writing in with that. Um, but yeah, it's kind of this flowery language or not getting to the point exactly. Well, you see it too. I, I listen to Blue Radio um, less frequently these days, but um, like they can have a, a kind of show like this and it'll be just for two or three hours, a couple of people just kind of giving the, their whole... Their I've, got, I've, got, I've got a great one for you here, Brendan. Yeah, getting short to the point. So, um, actually, you know, I was at a presentation ceremony fairly recently. Um, and again, you know, they kind of go, they want to do presentations for everybody, everybody to do a presentation. There's 30 or 40 people in this room. So that's going to be a presentation of two hours. And, you know, I just stand up and you know, I'm finished in, you know, less than a minute. You know, let's move on. Let's get to the next person. But, yeah, no, I have the person. That's a real faux pas because what I haven't done is I haven't thanked everybody. And I've been to so many um, press conferences where, or, or media events where, yeah, literally every person who speaks, every single person will thank all the people in the room by name by title and you know so it's five minutes for every single speaker extra wasted and you're just thinking oh god do, do, but again, the phrase, yeah, does it not does the the phrase here not work in, in like in spanish in english as we'd say i, I echo, echo the comments of ali and move on uh, yes, I, I, exactly. no, but no it doesn't. Now, our producer is writing frantically to us. There was a lot we didn't touch on. It's, it's something I know we can come back to in future episodes. But a, a final one, because I did mention it at the start, the, the slamming of car doors. We just think we're closing them. Now, what, I, I don't know what that's about. I, I would say that I have seen some... Um, I have seen some usually Americans that do, I mean, it's like they think they're Thor out of Marvel, really hammering something closed. Yeah, uh, but I think most people, well, in my experience anyway, I just think I'm closing it to make sure that it is uh, closed correctly. And then, like, ironically, these are taxi drivers or drivers in general who drive their vehicle like madmen anyways, if it's a ballistic missile. Um, so that you're just closing the door a little with a bit more force than normal. Anyway, we are uh, on the hour here, Ali. Next week, uh, did we decide on that yet? Next week's another. We week. haven't. All right. Yeah. Ciao. Next week, guys. Ciao, ciao.